Sorry about that. It's so bad with it's nice. <laughs> Um, Hirsch Perlman is one of the most generous, welcoming, and insightful artists and academics I have known. His work is so varied that I would sooner parallel it to the growth and maturity of being human than apply a term as strategic as interdisciplinary. Perhaps this is because Hirsch understands the condition of art as a device to share and explore problems as much as it is a means of proposing answers. Profoundly aware of their own limitations and artifice, Hirsch's propositions are rich in humor, discomfort, and anxious narrative, while elegantly avoiding the pitfalls of monumental gesture and erudite claims. In 1996, only a couple years before we met in person, I experienced Hirsch's work at the Museum of Modern Art. It was located within a uniquely hermetic project room with his untitled series held, uh, <clears throat> sorry, where his untitled series held something I had yet to experience in art, the dismantling of communication, or more specifically, of conversation in all of its banalities and failures. The approach was precise, a careful convergence of scientific pragmatism, aesthetic minimalism, and commercial grade performance laid out for all to explore. Keep in mind, this was a very precarious time for art and Hirsch grasped something fundamental about real human engagement and the scripting of fictional characters at a moment when unpacking narrative, let alone exploring the troubles of casual discourse, were not part of art's common vernacular of deconstructive analysis. In short, Hirsch had located something new. It was a new that had been right in front of all of us at all times, and he had done so with a certain exactitude. Ever growing, Hirsch's work would go on to capture himself in a state of lived performance through a pinhole camera clad in cardboard boxes and packing material. As literary as it was aesthetic, Hirsch became Gregor-like, isolated in a room, <laughs> monitored, and continually transforming. Still evolving and responding, Hirsch created visions of nuclear apocalypse through op optical trickery allowing us to consider how the magic of analog photographic process can easily and ominously point to the gravity and consequence of other more magnificent displays of light. And then there were cat drawings and counterinsurgency manuals, a post 9-11 practice grappling between the terrors of power and the comforts of home. And finally, as the first decade of the 21st century closed, Hirsch produced his first monumental works, massive photographic prints of his cats, <laughs> arguably paralleling their emotional and cultural importance with their physical grandeur. And we'll let Hirsch frame where he is now, but before I go, I'm going to share some details about his career. A graduate of the MFA program at Yale University, Hirsch has been exhibiting his work internationally for three decades. He has been on the faculty of UCLA since 2006, having held the position of chair of the art department from 2013 to 2018. In addition to this, Hirsch has taught at the Royal College of Art, Yale University, Cal Arts, the School of Art Institute of Chicago, and many other highly respected institutions. He has received two National Endowments for the Arts Fellowship, as well as the coveted Tiffany Foundation Grant. His extensive exhibition records includes the Renaissance Society in Chicago, the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Wattis, Succession, and many others. Finally, Hirsch has been included in major exhibitions including the 1989 and 2002 Whitney Biennials and the 1993 Venice Biennale and 2009 Hammer Biennial. However, none of this, and I mean this, none of this amounts to even one conversation or one hour-long critique with Hirsch. <laughs> Thank you. Charlie, thank you, thank you for that. I love you. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, back, back at you. Uh, and thank you, Jim, and to the Center for Art and Society for the invitation. I'm really pleased and honored to be here today. Um, this lecture was at first uh, my response to an invitation uh, this past fall to speak at the Chicago Humanities Festival on the subject of belief. And I tripped over what an artist atheist could say about belief until it hit me that, of course, belief 
like every other meaningful human activity, like every other meaningful human mentality, including art and narrative, is a meme and is entirely built upon memes. As an artist and a teacher, it's an extraordinary privilege to make a living by playing, and whether that's playing with, me with materials or playing with meaning. And the currency for all that play is memes. Memes make meaning. So a very quick primer refresher on memes. Uh, Richard Dawkins introduced uh, memes in his book, The Selfish Gene. He first described memes as a unit of cultural transmission. In his recent book, uh, From Bacteria to Bach and Back, the philosopher Daniel Dennett describes memes as ways of doing something or making something, but not instincts, which are a different kind of ways of doing something or making something. So the difference is that instincts are carried genetically and memes are transmitted perceptually. DNA is the medium for genes, whereas a medium for memes might be a body or another medium outside of the body that makes the memes information available to one or more of our senses so that the information can be perceived by someone else and imitated for others to perceive and so on. So memes manifest large and small. Every word in every language is a meme to the memes that were once each of these deities. Together, all those gods constitute an overall meme of belief further dividing into all the nuances of particular belief memes that each god once rep represented. So origin stories are certainly memes with very, with very longevity, needless to say. Narrative itself might be something of an er meme. And it's the narrative aspect of memes that makes them like recipes, in that they are always subject to individual alterations made by you and me or anyone in our imitation or replication of that meme. Some memes adapt and spread quickly, and some very slowly and enduringly, and not always for the better. Just think of fake news as a more insidious version of old-fashioned misinformation. Gossip and dissembling are probably as old as language itself. Memes make up shared interpretive communities and even ancestries. Memes help build social cohesion, but also social stratification. And if there's one thing we know the internet excels at, any meme that catches on will be certain to go through lots of adaptations. It's a kind of crowdsourced satire. And just to be sure, <laughs> it's just to be sure that I haven't overemphasized the internet's extraordinary meme-making capabilities, these are both memes just 30,000 years apart. <laughs> So more than engines of meaning, memes are a special case of evolutionary ad adaptations. Genes replicate life, memes replicate culture. So we live memes. They're always in action and often plain to see, like the ancient meme of one person getting up in front of a group and having something to say, telling stories, conjuring images. This is a fifth century lecture hall in Alexandria. And I'm thinking that the oblong shape is so the lecturer can pace back and forth. So I'm going to give you an abbreviated tour through the complex of memes I've been considering in my pedagogy, my artistic practice, and my previous role as department chair. So this will be a lecture in cuts between how I teach, how I work, and what I advocate. So starting with pedagogy, I perceived as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and abhorred, that it was the wretch whom I had created. So that's Dr. Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's novel describing the moment of meeting the monster again after the years of havoc and murder his creation caused. This is where I start my advanced sculpture class. I'm a fan of thinking about Frankenstein as an allegory about art and science and responsibility and what makes us human. I like to think of Dr. Frankenstein as an artist. What artist, no matter what sort of work they make, doesn't want their work to live in one sense or another? Frankenstein is both a literal and a, metaphor, and a metaphorical rendition of that. This is the frontispiece to the second edition of Frankenstein, published in 1831. It's not immediately clear which figure is Dr. Frankenstein and which figure is the monster. One presumes that the naked figure is the monster. At around the same time that Frankenstein went into print, Goethe finished Faust. And Faust is, of course, on a quest for the true essence of life. This is a 19th century engraving of Faust's assistant making a homunculus according to the methods of ancient alchemy. 
Now, by Goethe's time, post-enlightenment, the idea that life could be made from scratch, manufactured, would have been dwindling, as though we know better than to try to mess with the secret of concocting life. That aspiration is still in play. You can imagine that this gives me permission to talk about all sorts of derivations of homunculi throughout history, from the alchemist's quest to create life to all monsters, golems, puppets, gods, creation myths, ad infinitum, including the homunculi that still bedevil brain science. This is an illustration of the homunculus argument where a simple theory of vision proposes that light forms an image on the retina and something in the brain looks at those images as if on a screen. The homunculus argument shows that this is not a full explanation because all that one has done is to place an entire person or homunculus behind the eye who gazes at the retina. In any theory of vision, the homunculus argument invalidates any hypothesis that does not explain projection that is the experience that the viewing point is in the brain and separate from the things that are seen. So, mm -hmm. homunculus arguments are useful for detecting where theories of mind fail or are incomplete. If you have to revert to the silly and stubborn fantasy of the little person inside you that pulls the levers, then you haven't explained anything or not completely. There is no ghost in the machine. That is, there is no soul, there are only physical, chemical processes, and those processes are fully embodied, not relegated to mind or body only. It's a William Stein uh, drawing, by the way. So Gilbert Ryle coined the term ghost in the machine, this is around 1949, and when students first hear that phrase, they might tend to associate it with the science fiction of a computer like HAL in 2001, A Space Odyssey that becomes sentient and then dangerous. But Ryle meant just the inverse of that. Here the human body is the machine, and the ghost, some other ineffable thing in the body that is, quote, mind or soul. So Ryle exercises the soul with a snarky, there is no ghost in the machine. I'll try to deem having just now rendered the rest of my re remarks as soulless. <laughs> Continuing on then, albeit without a soul. Ryle argued that the mind is a set of capacities and abilities belonging to the body. All, the reference, all references to the mental must be understood, at least theoretically, in terms of witnessable activities. So to get students thinking about these thresholds between inside and outside, mind and body, measurement and metaphor, I have them measure their sensory homunculus. And if you've never heard of this, the cartoon above illustrates body parts proportionally to the amount of sense receptors in those parts, and thus the brain space represented by those same parts. Once the students have collected their data, they can utilize it any way they see fit. Some may translate it into some, something material, or some may try to train some part of their sensory homunculus and actually change their sensitivity. The way, for instance, a violinist will have a lot more sense receptors in their fingertips and thumbs than non-violinists. And I think of sculpture as an intermediary in the so-called mind-body problem, whereby we perceive mind and body to be separate, or even believe that mind is constituted by an immaterial soul. Every figurative sculpture ever made is a projection of a particular mind-body relationship, an embodied attitude, aspiration, or failure. So between 1998 and 2001, I sequestered myself in a room with cardboard doppelgangers my own hybrid homunculi, a personal clubhouse of self-replicating alter egos that occasionally found a common literary voice in the notes my wife Erin Cosgrove stole from me and later returned as an embellished memoir of a tortured artist, a Frankensteinian and Faustian meme all at once. So I'm going to go through a few images from that project and uh, read from that memoir. Day one. I made figure one in my likeness, starting with a large FedEx box torso and a mail tube neck. A grocery bag stuffed with trash and newspapers constitutes the head. Duct tape joints. Suddenly, my garbage seems full of promise. Day six, figure one relines, rel reclines on the carpet with all the self-satisfaction of a Roman emperor waiting to be fed. I begin the creation of figure two. In two hours, the population of the room has doubled. Two figures now, and I don't know what to do first. It's as though we're all drunk. 
Day seven. Awoke this morning in a state of agitation. Dressing quickly, I run to the room. They'd spent the remainder of day six getting acquainted, sprawled out on the floor like stoned adolescents. But adding a second figure has turned them both into misanthropes. Day 11. Figure two has developed an adorable shyness around me I can't yet account for. I marvel at his perfection. Day 16. Hastily, I construct four more figures. A gang emerges. They're not doing nice things to each other. Still, I couldn't be happier. Day 18. I've spoken to X about my new project. I tried to be cool, downplay its import. X showed interest, said she wants to see my figures. What does she want? I told her it isn't time yet, already knowing that X would never see the room. It's too much in jeopardy. No one will. Day 63. The truth is close. X would have me temper my time in the room, suggesting I might split it with non-room related activities. She acts like I'm a businessman who should keep business hours. I must follow this body of work down the ever darkening path it forges. Don't just execute those ideas that remain compelling, utterly obliterate them. Day 65, a very active day today. We worked from daybreak to well past happy hour. First reenacting a rodeo, then a stock market crash, then an Olympic downhill, and last, their favorite, 120 days of Sodom. We are rewriting history trying to get it right. Day 68. I need to protect this work from prying eyes. I know how humans are. They ruin everything. I've devised a plan. I'll take everybody apart. With those parts, I'll build one very large head. They'll be safe in my head. This idea produces momentum and motivation. Day 80. I indulged my tears as I converted my figures into the giant heap that would feed the head. What was the meaning of figure five's final gesture? The head is cannibalizing everything and still demanding more. Day 81, the head is grand, massive. Had it a body, it would stand 75 feet tall. Sometimes I imagine the giant head rolling through Los Angeles, crushing all, of it, all in its wake. <laughs> Day 98, I no longer recognize X. I suggested that maybe we could continue if she'd agree to put a box over her head, or at least a bag. I knew just the box for her, cubicle, with large red letters on a bright yellow ground. Day 113. I scare myself a bit each day, and at night, thoughts of my head run through my head. My head is all I think of now. Day 149. X looked at my photos, speechless of course. Later, she emailed me a list of disorders she believes I exhibit. Macrophilia, attraction to giants or giant creatures. Nebulophilia, arousal from fog. Teratophilia, arousal from deformed or monstrous people. Ichnolagnia, arousal from contact with sculptures or pictures. So I wouldn't want to have to decide if that is an impersonation or my core artist self. It's all true. Other colossal heads halfway around the world in 800 years ago, the Moai, those giant head sculptures of Easter Island, uh, Easter Island, likely destroyed a population. The heads were quarried from the middle of the island and were likely moved to the shores with the help of timber from trees. Pre-Moai, the island was 80% forest. Post-Moai, no forest and almost no people. It's believed that the Rapa Nui completely exhausted their resources building and moving Moai. In his 2011 book, The Beginning of Infinity, the physicist David Deutsch says of the Rapa Nui that sustaining their civilization in its static, statue-obsessed state was never an option. And he recalls J Jacob Bernowski's visit to Easter Island at the start of the Ascent of Man series. Bernowski describes the culture that built the Moai as watching the stars go overhead without ever trying to understand them. So for Bernowski and Deutsch, Easter Island is a dramatic case study of a culture stuck in their memes. But then that faithful and consistent replication of memes all the way to self-destruction is likely a remnant from our very first outings in imagination, from a time in our development when the replication of memes depended upon consistency and fidelity. Fidelity is necessary to be sure that the memes say of utilizing fire or making an arrowhead replicated properly. 
But those same pressures towards, fidel towards fidelity and consistency can derail a, so a society and do it in. So said another way, a maladaptive mean can be put into service for something other than genes, say colossal heads, or even just one normal size orange head as president. <laughs> Maladaptive memes can be plain as day. Visibility alone can't protect, can't protect us or even lessen the destruction. Bernowski asked the prescient questions, why didn't they take better care and why didn't they ever get off the island? David Attenborough completed Bernowski's caution when he compared Easter Island to Island Earth. Now, creating new knowledge is how we keep memes on the move, expanding and adapting. New knowledge is what drives narratives. Research universities, maybe public research universities in particular, should be the first front of institutionalizing a broad, accessible, and continuing quest for new knowledge across the sciences and the humanities. That may all sound like a no-brainer, but those primary tenets are by no means a given or secure, the humanities continues to get squeezed by the false dichotomy of useful versus useless areas of study. You might recall Senator Marco Rubio took a swipe of the humanities in an unctuous call for more welders, i.e. a useful trade, and fewer philosophers, i.e. a useless trade, at the fourth Republican debate in November of 2015. And actually, useless degrees are still being shelled at places like Trump University, thankfully out of the picture now, but many other for-profit colleges continue to bilk their students, victims of deceptive recruitment and predatory lending. And how's that not a gigantic maladaptive meme? Universities all over the country maintain the pu moniker public when their dependence on philanthropy has never been higher. This is what's left of Haran University. It thrived in eighth century Turkey one wonders what American universities will look like in a thousand years. If we continue to neglect pursuits where the utility or meaning, let alone the path to the paycheck, isn't always obvious, then higher education is doomed to maladaptive education means that will demand fidelity and consistency to a narrow vision of how universities should be dividing their resources. To avoid that bleak future, it's high time the concept of what is useful include curiosity for its own sake and creative research that doesn't aspire to predictable outcomes. And that's not some esoteric intellectual call. That's exactly what it would mean to look at art in evolutionary terms. Brian Boyd says, creativity as a principle, as a Darwinian process, solves no particular pre-specifiable problem, but it offers an additional way of generating new possibilities that may prove to solve problems, even significant ones provided there is a consistent pressure towards a solution, whether over generations as in natural selection or over weeks or months or years, as when a storyteller, say, drafts and revises a story or in only minutes or seconds in the spreading of neural activation in a poet or a scientist seeking a new image or idea in a mind prepared over many years by many trials. So pressure toward a solution I think is a little confusing, but I think Boyd is using solution loosely here. As an artist, you don't always know the problem you're trying to solve, often true in the sciences too, and staying open and aware of possible solutions to those problems you didn't know you had is a valuable asset. Or just think of the commonality in science and art that new discoveries, new knowledge often appears in the mistakes made along the path of pursuing something else altogether. So what if what we call creativity, adapting and inventing means, is something like a sped up version of the problem solution feedback loop of natural selection. Like every organism's continuing testing of new opportunities or new affordances and acquiring new competencies or extinguishing them, artists and students test opportunities and, and acquire new competencies in materials and in metaphors, also in a feedback loop. Our super specialized and abstracted real reality obviously has very discursive demands on creativity compared to the savanna, where for hundreds of thousands of years, our ancestors began being creative by consistently replicating the memes their very survival depended upon. So super specialized reality case in point. In my own meme evolution, my survival wasn't exactly at stake in the fact that when I was here, 
I couldn't possibly have anticipated that I would arrive here. Those are my, my, my means evolving. Whatever else this garbage Godhead image relays to you, it was the result of an ongoing process of testing affordances and acquiring new competencies in materials like cardboard and duct tape, and in metaphors like companions and doppelgangers. As some adaptations fell away, i.e. the individuals and others got replicated, i.e. colossal heads. So for me, the, re the reward is arriving somewhere that I couldn't have anticipated. Probably because for an artist, that's where the new knowledge is. That's where the solutions to the problems I didn't know I was solving are. That's where they're lurking, waiting to be found out as solutions. So I believe this is where we left off with the means enacted by my studio practice. And day 167 says, the vice is ready. Faced with the head's demise, I've never felt so alone. It seems we have nothing to say to each other. Still, I'm reluctant to crush him. Nonetheless, crush him, I did. So these, this project, these pictures were always hung salon style in no particular order. And the parts of that project that I've, that I've exhibited ended around day 176. Though I did nonetheless go on to improve the design and the, uh, the effectiveness of the vice aforementioned. <laughs> and like the cardboard figures and the head, my vice also starts to take on a life of its own. It was clear that I needed to get out more. So in the fall of 2002, I began to spend time on the roof of the building I lived in with no particular objective. And that time inevitably drifted into evening. I liked being up there. It was a relief from the room, and as corny as it is, I began to feel as though I was keeping some sort of vigil. So I spent a lot of time reading there. And this is now the winter of 2003, while the drumbeat to war in Iraq is getting steadily louder and seeming more inevitable every day. These are all long exposures on, on film. And something Herbert Mouchamp wrote it, around then in the New York Times felt very close. It's a mysterious idea at the end of a short piece about what should be built at ground zero. He says, I would propose a school a center of unlearning as well as learning, a place for disembedding ourselves from the welter of fantasies that has enveloped the country in recent years. My other favorite proposal for Ground Zero was a drawing that Ellsworth Kelly sent to the New York Times, you might recall. It was just one big gentle hill of grass over the entire site. But I love the idea of a school for unlearning. It sounded like maybe a way to ferret out maladaptive memes and my perch on the roof felt something like a private version of that, way before I could have described it that way. I started drawing into the long exposures I was making, I was making initially by accident, when the apparatus I used to hold my reading lamp came loose and made a simple arc. So I started drawing deliberately. There was drawing on different scales. These are lines uh, from a helicopter circling above me, which all led inevitably to drawing rockets just beyond, just beyond my reading station. I would make uh, simple jigs that would help me make all these different shapes with the light. You can see the duration of the exposure in the star trails. It's still another larger scale of drawing. I started concocting more visitors, slightly more articulated. It was always hard to say whether they were coming or going or confronting or just glaring. Whatever the case, if I was in the frame at all, I remained unaware. And for a while, I started concentrating on just the rockets. They were titled with a kind of roadrunner, wild E. Coyote Latin.
So up to this point, I hadn't decided, though, if my rockets really represented fight or flight. But in the winter of 2003, I had to picture explosions. Early on, they looked more like some alien blob thing. That's downtown LA in the background on the right. But just as I think I'm hitting my stride, my landlord sees me lurking up there on the roof, and needless to say, it isn't <coughs> happy about my nighttime studio on the roof. So I had to take what I was calling Operation Idiocracy into the studio. The numbers refer to the roll number and the frame number on the roll, so that supposedly, as the numbers increase, I make a more persuasive explosion. Sixty-two years ago, Harold Edgerton made this picture of a nuclear detonation just milliseconds after the detonation. Now, I've always thought these were downright some of the most otherworldly pictures ever. Some of my Operation Idiocracy pictures were approximations of Edgerton's pictures. And I think my proximity here is very close to something that I steer students to be very skeptical of, which is aestheticizing something horrible and reducing complicated and nuanced reality to abstracted formalities. But I like to think that my detonations and explosions are just too ridiculous to carry that kind of burden since they were all made from beach balls and Christmas lights. This is, this is typically how the, how the uh, explosions were installed. And the other picture that I showed you previously, I always try to avoid a sort of fetishy photo installation. I like to pack it tight. And uh, I usually think that encourages the semblance of a story. So in a body of work from about 10 years ago, I extrapolated the farcical fantasy of to what and where the rockets might lead. These photos try to have it both ways. They might be the consequence of, the consequence of explosions, the remains of sandcastles, or they might be otherworldly, a place the rockets landed after getting off the island, so to speak. They're all long exposures shot at the ocean. They're also titled with cartoon Latin. These are called ergo despero, meaning maybe something like therefore despair. And if only we could train maladaptive memes to self-destruct. This is my modest attempt at turning a maladaptive meme against itself. It's exactly what it says it is. In 2006, you could download the new official US Army counterinsurgency manual for free. I think it's published and purchasable now. And these were part of the same show with the Wastelands. It was a sort of production line to print a self-published unlimited edition of the counterinsurgency manual. It's $29 a copy, and all the money went evenly to two places. The Center for Constitutional Rights, which is still working to restore habeas corpus for the remaining detainees at Guantanamo Bay, and an organization called National Popular Vote, which is still working to get each state to pass a bill that would essentially abolish the power of the Electoral College so that what happened in 2000, Bush v. Gore, couldn't happen again. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> the Wasteland pictures were mixed with a series of large silkscreen drawings of cats. These were called Schrodinger cats, referring to the physicist Erwin Schrodinger's thought experiment about quantum states. And perceptually, in person, they're a little bit more like this. They produce a sort of fake, cheap 3D. It's one drawing, just slightly out of register in red, green, and yellow. And for me, they were something like anxious occupiers of the deserted wastelands, kind of state animal after the state is gone.
There may be no ghost in the machine, but don't discount the ghost in the cat. Stephen Mithen, an evolutionary anthropologist, describes material culture, that is, everything we make, as the disembodiment of mind, which first began, according to Mithen, after four specialized intelligences developed in separate locations in the early human brain began to talk to each other. Then anthropomorphizing, totemism, and metaphor happens. The counter perspective would call that a neurocentric view and that the symbolic revolution could only have been the result of embodied collaboration between mind, body, and environment, including other minds too, of course. Now, Atushi Iriki, a fac faculty member at the Raikon Brain Institute in Japan says that tool use may have led to the ability to disembody the sense of self from the literal flesh and blood boundaries of one's skin. As such, tool use might be precursorial to the capacity to objectify the self. And Eschelian hand axes, some of the very first beam vehicles, or maybe the first beam vehicles, may have been stepping stones leading to those early projections of self. Humans made these tools for over a million years, and there are stone tools one million years older than these. But Eschelian technology is quite weird in some ways. On one hand, these tools seem to be the Swiss army knife of the Paleolithic. On the other hand, they were also sometimes made in sizes that would have been too small or too large to have any utility, which have led some to believe that these odd-sized axes were the beginning of symbolic art. While others have recently theorized that even that symmetry, even the symmetry of the axes, might be a natural outcome of the process, not a preconceived goal of the maker. But either way, for millennia upon millennia, our capacity to objectify the self may have been slowly simmering in the liminal space between the affordances of the raw material, the stone, and the sensory motor properties of the homonym hand. This is the view of Lambros Meleferis, a proponent of something called material engagement theory. He says, the tool guides the grip, the grip shapes the hand, the hand makes the tool, and engaging the tool shapes the mind. When it comes to tool making and tool using, it is not appropriate to see the brain as the executive controller for the embodied activity, rather it is the other way around. Now embodied activity controls the brain. So from Malafaris, through most of Paleolithic, uh, through most of the Paleolithic human body development, human mind body development, there's no boundary between mental and physical. Intention and material affordance are inseparable, which I think is easier to understand in words than in his diagram. So we can't know for sure if or how much these axes, these means, made themselves known to their users. Obviously, they were known in that they were highly replicated. But despite the weirdness of some of their sizes, there is a very fundamental difference between the mean vehicle of the hand axe and the mean vehicle, say, of this figure, which is commonly known as Lion Man. So we were making stone tools for well over two million years. We've spent a tiny fraction of that making likenesses of ourselves. Everyone agrees that this sort of artifact is demonstrative of a fuller level of consciousness than a stone axe. Not that we can help it, but a lot of energy goes into being conscious. It's commonly known that more of the total energy we need goes to our brains than any other animal. So it's costly to be conscious, and still more costly to be creative. The lion figure is estimated to have taken someone 400 hours. That's 400 hours that someone didn't have to contribute to making sure there was food or guarding against real lions. So that investment is direct. The lion person enacts and materializes the drive to anthropomorphize. Lion person is a mean vehicle for anthropomorphism. And to have the capacity to anthropomorphize, humans at this point must have recognized that what they imposed on material was now also in the brain. Simply put, half man, half lions don't exist. So we can say that something more of this artifact came from the brain. And the significant step that this takes is that now, Malafra says, the Paleolithic person has the opportunity to become, maybe for the first time, the engineer of his or her own perception. Images, as is also the case with language, enabled humans to think about thinking. Images provide a scaffolding device that enables human perception 
to become aware of itself. So a number of years ago, I had a mind to make a mechanical articulated joint, perhaps for an unknown figure. And for some reason, I would have to do this with no hardware, no glue, no fittings, just wood. Two years of tooling up and experimenting followed, and I arrived at a chain of interlocking wooden axles, nuts, and bolts. These parts were infinitely adjustable and could be locked in any or orientation. I toyed with a variety of uses, placement, and attachments. Many kinds of wood were put to the test. The best wood, lignum vitae, which means wood of life, comes from South America. It's an extraordinary wood with a resin that acts as a natural built-in lubricant. It has a lovely smell. One of the very first mechanical clocks ever made was made out of lignum vitae. And believe it or not, that wood is used to make large bearings in hydroelectric generators. Generators are being retrofitted with lignum vitae bearings because they last longer and are greener than steel. I buy the cutoffs from the company that makes those bearings. Another year of toying and the real meaning of the joint unfolded. It's a mechanical schematic of thinking. The brain is a versatile tool. These parts were too adaptable to be regular joints. They were mind, not body. So I built a number of prototypes, 10 to 12 foot tall stick person bodies, limbs, with my adjustable joints as neurons, hair, headdress, each thinking itself. And I like to think that I was building an army. I called them the infantry imperfecti. And at this scale, their, head, their head parts were made of plastic lumber that was made from recycled milk, milk curtains. Their feet are also plastic, and wood beams made up the legs, torsos, and arms. Every conscript in the infantry imperfecti standing army was stuck in a pose, mulling over the mind-body dilemma. Is the subject I that I believe I experience a metaphor or a body, or always both? They're humanists by holding that puzzle of consciousness in perpetuity in their physical form and structure. Or are we all brain? Or are we one brain? Or all body? It's easy to believe that we live mostly in our heads. Consciousness is constantly juggling symbols from sensory input. We can't help but ascribe motives and moral values even to simple geometry. You've likely seen the Heider symbol experiment from 1944, where in a simple animation of these two triangles, a circle and a box, a drama unfolds. Not only do we have no trouble projecting an inner life on those simple shapes, we couldn't help it if we tried. And that process of making meaning with metaphors has a physical effect on the brain and body and vice versa. If you are holding a warm cup of coffee in your hands as you watch this, you are more likely to have positive feelings towards what I'm saying. If you have something heavy in your lap right now, you're more likely to consider these ideas weighty. Robert Sapolsky, one of the leading biologist neurologists doing this research says, this neural confusion about the literal versus the metaphorical gives symbols enormous power, including the power to make peace. So said another way, that neural confusion about the literal versus the metaphorical can be adaptive, i.e. peacemaking, or maladaptive, i.e. troublemaking. Many hundreds of years before the Rapa Nui were chiseling their island away from under themselves, Confucius's arguments against the sometimes practiced mass live burials of the emperor's courts, servants, and soldiers got enough traction to convince an emperor to have a life-size terracotta army buried in its stead. Confucius had argued that while people must eventually turn to dust, the terracotta army would protect the emperor forever. So, which isn't to say that Emperor Qin Shi Wang was by any means a humanitarian. He also had hundreds of Confucian scholars buried alive, and thousands, maybe tens of thousands, died making his wall. Apparently, he also buried his imperial concubines and maybe all the artisans who built the terracotta army and the tomb. Still, the terracotta army changed the meme of burying alive the entire court and army with the emperor. And, of course, everyone knows that every soldier in the terracotta army is an individual. No two faces or bodies are identical. 
Archaeologists are wondering if each mod of, uh, if they were each modeled on an actual person, each soldier a portrait. And you can see why. It's quite striking, yeah. and more so even in person. Their faces don't emote much, but their subjectivity and their humanity is unmistakable. While the Terracotta army is older than the Moai, the Moai were obviously a, a maladaptive meme, whereas the Terracotta army was, in its way, a progressive meme. So metaphors matter, and maybe especially mind-body metaphors. And if I managed to properly anchor my army to the ground, they might still stand. I missed the storm and the battle, but not its aftermath. I knew I would need to draw this out and look at the carnage for a long time before I knew what it meant. The infantry imperfecti were models of a still powerful fantasy, the busy, infinitely nuanced, and in control brain atop stickman cutout dot structures. Many drawings later, I realized that my decimated figures represented the vanquishing, the obliteration of that old dualism, the mind-body split. This was an important defeat. The battlefield needed to be documented for posterity. Uh, despite my, my personal war on the mind-body split, my own very real brain persists in the illusion of its superiority. The battlefield drawings didn't exercise my own mind-body problem. And I couldn't help thinking of the extraordinary level of embodied expression in the mourners from the tomb of Philip the Bold, all the more extraordinary for being made in the late 1300s. These sculptures wear their hearts on their sleeves, or as a better metaphor, that their hearts are heavy. Mind-body metaphors in language are, and probably always have been, utterly ubiquitous. In their book, Surfaces and Essences, Analogy as the Fuel and Fire of Thinking, Hofstetter and Sander write, without opening one's eyes for a split second, one can see things in one's own way, watch the trends, and think that things are looking ominous. Where does the literal end and metaphor begin? Where does metaphor end and the literal end begin? <laughs> right. It's so easy to invoke consequential existential mind-body metaphors that it feels alarmingly nonchalant. It's also easy to see mind-body memes in action now Consider what Colin Kaepernick began a year ago, or the 100-year-old terror campaign of Confederate so-called monuments being finally put down. Mind-body memes as they're, transmit as they're transmitted through bodies, language, art, and iconography matter. So in thinking about my failure to vanquish my own mind-body problem, this is humanitas equanimitas, a human model, a sculpture of embodiment five blocks equal in size, and two more blocks with the same profile but slightly longer for legs. I liked the immediate recognition that these seven blocks were human, but it took a long time for me to convince myself of their ability to project affect. So months of stacking block bodies followed. I kept stacking them, and I wondered if I was being simplistic. Was I just playing with blocks? I'm happiest in my own creative process when I can't decide whether or not what I'm, what I, when I can't decide whether or not I'm serious about whatever it is I'm doing. And if I go back and forth about that, that's a good sign somehow. But still, when is a block just a block? I also like that these figures were international as they were made from random tropical hardwoods from Southeast Asian and South American rainforests, which sounds absolutely terrible. 
but the wood was harvested long ago to supply the vast quantities of dunnage needed to secure the ever-increasing global transport of cargo. And I reclaim it as discarded stained wood posts, every post a migrant with unknown origins more often than not. I don't know what kind of wood it is until I mill it, and often I still can't identify it. Estimates of the number of tree species in the world range from 20,000 to 100,000, and only a very tiny percentage have been identified. Apparently, a block is almost never just a block. We're called a Hyder Simmel demonstration. Or from my haptic artist's perspective, when squaring up a block of wood in the workshop, I consider the metaphors that I'm enacting, ordering, controlling, abstracting. Simply squaring a block of wood turns out to be a set of warm-up metaphors towards a meaning that I likely don't yet have in mind. So I ask myself, what would be the very bare minimum that I might intentionally animate them, the minimum that I could get away with? Armature wire or magnets connect the blocks now, and a haptic balancing act between hands and blocks can achieve infinite posabilities and affect. Every seven blocks, now an individual, a subject, nearly a self. And I build them at any size, from five inches high on up. It's a picture of 10 on site in their owner's homes. And this is a final exhibition form of Humanitas Equanimitas. This is an exhibition with Lisa Lipinski and Anna Helm at Midway Contemporary in Minnesota. This is an installation shot of the same show that's now at uh, Rice University at the Moody Center. So I've continued to make the craniumless brains. They're downsized, and I've taken away the body. All busy brains now. Heads on poles. And that insistence of my busy brain, for me, were called the extraordinary sculptures of Franz Messerschmitt, an 18th century sculptor who died at the age of 47 in 1783. But as much as this appears to be all mentality, all brain, these are sculptures like the mourners of embodiment, just not at all in the way you'd ever guess. This is known as grimacing head. This is known as the yawner. But these aren't Messerschmitt's titles. These are the accepted titles that you find in books. This is identified as afflicted with constipation. <laughs> and Messerschmitt never called these by the expression that they seem to illustrate to us. These grimaces are the result of Messerschmitt pinching himself in a way that he believed would relieve him of other pains. He thought he was illustrating and curing himself of an affliction caused by, quote, the spirit of proportion. And it's almost impossible not to read emotions into them and impossible to read from Messerschmitt's perspective as the remedy to a condition. Messerschmitt's personal compulsion and the means to which he committed himself may have been the cause of his undoing. Many of his materials are now known to be highly toxic. This could have been made like three years ago. This is known as the artist as he imagined himself laughing at himself, presumably. So some recent theories of mine suggest that a self is an illusion consciousness creates, another phantom homunculus, questioning what it means to say we are selves, that we have selves. That we know what that, but we know what that illusion feels like. We all believe we are a self. What would that illusion look like? This is Humanitas ex nil, a cranium that outlines, frames, circumscribes, but contains nothing. A block around a cylinder that is open at its ends. That cylinder points in the direction of attention. That's what we do best: frame our attention, parse and pass on the incoming information while focusing on what's relevant at least most of the time. 
So when is a block just a block? When is a hole filled with presence, filled with attention? When is mind, mind, body, continuum not a self? Another William Steig drawing. What could be harder, what could be a harder story to dispel than that of having a self? What's doing all this mental gymnastics if not a self? If my sense of self is an illusion, it's a very powerful one, a very defining illusion. Not one any of us could just up and wander away from, even if we wanted to. And some blocks can't help themselves either. Lately, I've been making humanitas ex nil from the very heart of the tree, which is never good for dependable woodworking results. They warp and crack, and something like a self slowly emerges. Again, William Stey. The idea that the self is an illusion falls somewhere between existential dread and a Zen koan. So instead, I'll leave you with another very powerful and probably older illusion than ourselves. Lots of us grew up with the idea that somehow the atmosphere at the horizon was magnifying the rising, setting sun and moon. And that's why the sun and moon always appear bigger on the horizon. Well, it turns out that's not so. When you see a giant full moon rise, that enlargement is happening in your brain only. The moon illusion hasn't been fully explained. Why in the world would our brains make the moon bigger at the horizon? I wonder if the moon illusion triggers the same regions of the brain that are used in facial recognition. Do we enlarge sun and moon just enough to anthropomorphize and or humanize them? Maybe the moon illusion is a remnant from a time when bringing anything and everything closer, especially whatever may be on the horizon, and making it recognizable, literally in the case of friend or foe or prey, would have been very important and an obviously advantageous evolutionary adaptation, maybe predating language. The proverbial man in the moon, combined with the illusion of its size near the horizon, could be a weird, very old example that we have for a very, very long time confused the literal and the metaphorical. In this case, altering our reality and bringing more of something to our brains than is actually there in front of us. We are not only bad at distinctions between a reality and illusion, literal and metaphorical, as Sapolsky said, but blurring those distinctions may have even been advantageous at one point, while maladaptive at other points. In the evolutionary scheme of things, we haven't been doing any of this for all that long. So having imaginations is, in a sense, a skill that we're really not very good at. But that means we might get better at it. Our memes, both real and delusional, have maintained fidelity to an overall worldview of human exceptionalism. And you can bet that hubris is a maladaptive meme. We'll need memes that continents our evolutionary unexceptionalism. And that'll take humility and equanimity, less self, and introspection and empathy on a scale that we're not yet capable of. But I do believe that the humanities can help with that. Thank you. Be happy to take any questions if anybody's got any or comments. Questions are hard after two million years of stone tools. <laughs> okay, I'll start with a question. Um, so, taking this and thinking about your entire arc and then this kind of closure in this part of your life where you have been really responsible for leading a school or a program within mm -hmm. a school. Yeah. On the far end of all of this, from its beginning point about the confusion of making and market and distribution and communication, and your ability to be comfortable in yourself alone as a kind of researcher making objects, does it, do you care in the most profound sense about kind of not communicating or accessing or reaching people? That's really clearly part of what you're doing but what it means in this kind of other sphere